this is the way these sessions will run for the practice exams. Um, if you guys take them, obviously, right, then you come back and if you have questions about specific things, we'll talk about those subjects. Uh, other than that, I'm not going to like lecture to you guys necessarily. That's not the way it's going to go. And then for the FRQs, um, I'll assign those to you. Uh, we can definitely speak about them since we didn't get to work on them in class. Uh, but the way that I'll assign them to you is that you can self-grade them. So AP, uh, or College Board I should say, gives you all the information that you would need to score well, essentially, on the FRQ for the exams. Uh, there's a website too that once we get there, it's through Kaplan. And I'll give you guys this information, but it tells you like techniques to approach all the different types of FRQs, the four different types of FRQs for the test as well. Um, so I might put this on a piece, all this stuff on a piece of paper as well, and then come and distribute it to Mr. Clara and Ms. Mahaka here. <coughs> Reporting this, Mr. Resign? No. Did you do the practice exam, Mr. Deluzma? No, not yet, sorry. Nobody did the practice test. I did. Did you? Good. Only two people did. You and Miss Burns, I believe. How'd you do on it? Probably not to the surprise of anyone, Miss Burns got like a 49 out of 55. Oh, no. uh, that's really good. Yeah, she did really well. 45? Yeah. So if you haven't done it, this is not like a time that I'm going to sit here and you guys do like the entire practice exam. Um, you guys can go home and do it, and we can just push the session back or like mix two of the, like looking at two practice exams the next time, you know what I mean? Like we'll look at practice exam number one and two the next time as well. Uh, but yeah, there's like a question and answer, I guess, or explanation, I should say. <coughs> All right, so 45 says, which of the following accurately compares the formal and informal powers of the president? So. First of all, you have to ask yourself, what does formal power mean? Where can I find the formal powers of the president? In the Constitution, yeah, in Article 2 of the Constitution, right? Where can I find these informal powers? What does informal mean? Not explicitly stated, right? So these are powers that are essentially implied for the president. All right, so let's see if we can figure this out. Uh, so which of the following accurately compares the formal and informal powers of the President of the United States? Vetoing legislation to prevent a bill from becoming law. Uh, using a pocket veto to prevent a bill from becoming law. Do you guys remember the pocket veto? Yes. Yeah, what was the pocket veto? Yeah, so if, Cong if the president gets the bill placed on his desk, right, and this is all, like, I'm just building an image for you, but it's placed on his desk, and at the end of 10 days, right, after it's been placed on his desk, Congress is out of session, it gets pocket vetoed, okay? So Bill just dies, he doesn't go back into Congress, he's just dead at the end of that 10 days, right? All right, uh, using the bully pulpit, what was the bully pulpit? Actually, first we should say, is vetoing legislation, is that one of the formal powers of the president and the executive branch? Yes. Yeah, so we're going to keep A in mind. Uh, B, using the bully pulpit. Do you remember what the bully pulpit is? Where? Nobody? So the bully pulpit was essentially the media, if you remember, right? It's using the media as a way to like push the agendas and things of that nature, okay? Uh, to influence public opinion. An informal power, appointing ambassadors and receiving diplomats from other nations. Uh, do you remember about the president appointing different positions? Yeah, or some of the positions other than ambassadors. What's that? Yeah, members of the cabinet, sure. What else? Supreme Court justices, absolutely, right? Federal judges. 
That was a formal power, if you remember, right? The ability of the president to appoint. Who is it that confirms those appointments? Do you remember? What's that? The Senate, yeah. So not Congress as a whole, the Senate does, right? They have a lot more responsibility than the members of the House do. All right, so, well, they just gave us a formal power under informal, so it can't be B. Using the bully pulpit is not a formal power. You don't get to, like, this doesn't say that in the Constitution. The president will use the media to push their agenda. No. Okay. C, acting as commander-in-chief of the military. Hmm. And signing executive agreements with foreign nations. That's an interesting option. Let's keep C in mind. And using the power of the purse to support government programs. Who has the power of the purse? Secretary of Treasury. Who allocates the money? Congress. Who determines that? Yeah, Congress does, right? So Congress has the power of the purse. Uh, and using signing statements. No, signing statements are what he puts on bills before he sends them back to Congress, right? They're like notes on what he thinks a bill should have looked like. All right, so I think we're between A and C then. What do we think? A. Oh, I heard C and A. Why do you think A? Um, signing executive agreements is also a formal power, right? Signing executive agreements with foreign nations? Uh, yeah, you could say that, right? So then it's up to the Senate to then go forward and like approve anything that he's doing with foreign nations. The president's a diplomat. The president is chief diplomat, yeah. That's what he stated. Yeah. So we think A? I think A too, but we could be wrong. What'd you put, Ms. Simon? I don't do I didn't um, understand what the arm of the press was, so I thought it was a. Gotcha. Yeah, you'll probably see that phrase, okay? The power of the purse. Just know it means the power of money. Find money in the purse, okay? Let's see if we're right. Could be wrong. Oh, no, it's C. Miss McCulloch, if you're on campus, please call 72420. President's role as commander in chief of the armed. 72420. The armed forces of formal power explicitly authorized in the Constitution. Signing of executive agreements for nations is not included in the Constitution. It's considered to be an informal power of the presidency. Ah, yeah. Okay, so we had that wrong, Mr. Rosano. Signing executive agreements is going to be a formal power. Oh, alright. <coughs> Any other questions? Why, why is uh, the party being a formal power? Is that... So, wait, so the party being a formal yeah, A would be wrong in this case, right? So, so the pocket it's veto. Formal, formal yeah, it's going to be a formal power. That's my mistake. I thought it was informal. If it's a formal power, then it's a like, Right in the Constitution, yeah. So here, let's look at an Article 2. It might just still be considered the power to veto overall, right? So the pocket veto, the manner. I think pocket the, veto is what gets us there because I don't think it actually says pocket veto. I think it just mentions the 10 days. Yes.
trying to find the exact wording, that way we can see why we're confused. Uh, does it, do you guys have another question that we can move to while I'm looking for those? No? Question eight. Oops. Damn it. Yeah. On February 9, 2016, President Barack Obama released his budget proposal for the 2017 fiscal year. Okay. So remember, the president is making a budget proposal. So what does that mean, proposal? Asking, introducing, essentially, yeah. Facing a Republican Congress, so we know we have a divided government then, because we have a Democrat and uh, the executive branch and then a Republican Congress. Many declared the plan dead on arrival. Among the cited issue was Obama's request for $58.27 billion in discretionary spending for defense, which many Republicans believe was not enough. Which of the following most accurately explains the interaction between the President and the Congress regarding the defense budget? Uh, so Congress has the enumerated power to raise revenue, which is true, but is forced to work with the President because the President has the power to determine spending for each department in the upcoming fiscal year. Who has the power of the purse and determines the allocation of fundings? Congress does, right? So it can't be A. The President can create a budget for defense spending, but Congress has the power to execute laws and operate the government, which can affect how money is actually spent. Laws and operate the government. So the question here would be, it says Congress has the power to execute the laws. What is Congress's job regarding the laws? Eventually, they're going to pass them on to the president, you could say, yeah. So think about it, judicial branch does what with the laws? Interpret. Mm -hmm. Interpret. Interprets laws, yeah. Legislative is? <coughs> Creates, yeah, good. And the executive uh, executes or enforces laws, yeah, okay. So Congress does not have the power to execute laws, okay, so it can't be made. Congress passed the budget for the entire federal government, including defense, but it must consider the president's proposal because the president may veto the bill. That sounds pretty good. We already saw it a second ago. The president introduced a specific budget for defense, or yeah, sorry, bill for defense spending, but Congress uses its power of legislative oversight to set up a negotiation process with the president. You guys remember talking about congressional oversight? No, not at all. All right, so congressional oversight consisted of Congress having hearings and stuff, right? And they would look at the different departments that they had created to ensure that the money was being spent the way they had written the laws to do. Does that make sense to you guys? So like the FDA, for example, if they give the FDA X amount of money and the allocations, they'll check up on the FDA and all the programs the FDA has created, right? Does that make sense so far? So they'll come in, they'll check up and have hearings and say, where's all this money going? Okay, that's congressional oversight. Uh, so they're not gonna use that to negotiate. That is, that's not what congressional oversight is. So it's gonna be C. Yeah. The what? Well, they, give, they, give spend to the, they give money to the FDA, right? Yeah, to the bureaucracy, essentially. So all of these different elements of the bureaucracy. Regulatory agency, yeah. So, so does that does um, uh, the congressional oversight uh, does that go with like any other like, like corporations that is like government corporations? Do they have to be government corporations? Yeah, it's not private corporations. There's not gonna be congressional oversight there. Now, if Congress has a law in place, right? There's federal law in place and there's something happening with a corporate company, they will call them in and they'll, they'll ask them as well. Now, I don't wanna say interrogate, but they'll question them as well, I like, guess, to what's going on. Like Mark Zuckerberg had to go in front of Congress That's not long ago. About, yeah. yeah, 
And that was because there's different like privacy laws and things like that that were in question that were possibly being broken. But that, that, that wouldn't be like a congressional oversight. It's not congressional oversight. It's like if your parents give you an allowance or money, not an allowance. If they give you money and they say, I need you to go to the grocery store and pick up these items. Here's $100, right? If you come back and you only are supposed to have spent $50, right? And you come back with $0. They're going to use their oversight on you to say, okay, tell me where the money went, right? I gave you money, I told you you had a job to do, now tell me where it went, where did the money go? If you say, oh, I filled up on gas too, then their oversight should say, that makes sense, it adds up. Does that make sense to you? But if you went and you bought oh, who knows what, then no, you have failed the oversight of your parents. Same way with Congress and these bureaucratic entities. Homeland Security gets called in for, for meetings uh, by Congress almost all the time just because of how much they're spending on the border yeah. and where that money's being spent too. So. Does something happen when there's children who are grants or a different Yeah, the grants are, so remember there's different types of like, grants that we talked about and different types of money that the government's going to give. So dependent upon the type, then yeah, the government will be really strict with some things. Yeah, uh, yeah. good question. Uh, do we have another one we want to look at? Yeah. What are you going to tell us? Don't tell us. Oh, All right. I didn't actually hear, so let's see if we can figure this out. All right, which of the following scenarios best illustrates the concept of concurrent powers? What are concurrent powers? Do you remember? No? You do? What's that? So that's federalism, right? This division and sharing of power between the state governments and the federal government. These concurrent powers, right? In Spanish, what does the word con mean? With. with, okay? That's how I always think of concurrent powers. They're sharing them with each other, okay? We're learning here. Oh. So concurrent powers, okay? So that's what we need to keep in mind here. Uh, a, the president negotiates a treaty regarding climate change with foreign governments, but for the treaty to take effect, it requires approval by the Senate. All right, Does it, do we see any mention of state government here? And A? No, no, so it can't be that. Uh, B, as commander in chief of the military, the president orders troops to a foreign nation to address a potential threat to national security. Uh, no, I don't think so. There's no mention of states here. A Senate committee holds a hearing to discuss potential misuse of funds by the Department of Veteran Affairs. Here would be congressional oversight. This is a perfect example of congressional oversight. See, the Senate holds a hearing to discuss misuse of funds by the Department of Veterans Affairs. It's not concurrent powers, but that is congressional oversight. And D, the federal government provides about 25% of the total funding for highways and transit in the United States, while the other 75% of the funding comes from the states themselves. So we have the federal government giving some, the state government's giving some, and they're working together on the same project. Does that make sense to you guys? So like I-75, for example, this would be a good example of that. So for me, it's D. Does that make sense? Let's see if we got it right. Huzzah! Can you explain the current powers again? Yeah, so here, I'm gonna explain this. Watch this. <coughs> You guys know what a Venn diagram is? Yeah. Watch. Venn diagram. Federal. State. So with federalism, right, we have a division and sharing of powers. Here's our division, right, on the outsides of the Venn diagram. Federal powers, state powers. Does that make sense? What do we call federal powers? Do you remember? Find them in the Constitution, specifically. You guys have a lot of studying to do. <laughs> Lots of Heimler in your futures. So it's the D. Oh, delegated. There they are. Delegated, right? So we have delegated. Could start with an E as well. Enumerated, yes, I knew it was in there somewhere. Yes. All right, and there was one last word that started with an E. They all mean the same thing, though. I could 
could find them in the Constitution. They are oh, is it, um, EX. Is no, it's, it's, it's the oh, word. I know it. Okay. Yeah. Explicit? No. No, darn! Oh, I'm so mad. No. Expressed. Expressed. They're expressed in the Constitution, so right? I'm so close to them. So expressed as well. What do we call state powers, you recall? You're not going to know the federal. <laughs> well, what does the 10th Amendment say? Do you recall that? The what? The 10th Amendment. Oh, is that not? The, <coughs> the thing that not explicitly stated in the Constitution. That it's like, it belongs to the people in the state. It does, yeah, but there's a word before that. They are blank to the state and the people. Reserve. Yeah! <laughs> reserve. So these are reserve powers, okay? And then in the middle, we have our concurrent powers. Because look at that, they're shared here in the middle. Does that make sense to you? Alright, that's the best way I can explain concurrent powers to you, is that there's an overlap, okay? There's very strictly federal powers, there's very strictly state powers, so to speak, and then we have our concurrent powers, okay? There's a lot of gray that happens in government because of grants and things of that nature. If the states accept money from the federal government, that's the federal government really kind of like creeping into state <coughs> powers, right? This whole circle would move into the state powers. It doesn't ever go the other way. It's the federal government coming into the state powers. Yeah, this is the idea of federalism here. Yeah, because if we go all the way back to the beginning, right, the anti-federalists were afraid of too strong of a federal government. So they said, we have to ensure that the states are going to have powers. Boom, 10th Amendment, right? We're going to make federalism a real thing. Okay? Anything not found in the Constitution belongs to the states. Cut and dry. Does that make sense, Mr. Savalos? Cool. Can you go over pork barrel legislation? Yeah, pork I barrel. I completely forgot what that meant. Is there a question on it? Yeah, two. Two? Okay, which of the. Ah, oh God! I forget to do this. Okay, which of the following scenarios best illustrates a member of Congress supporting pork barrel legislation? What else does a pig make for food other than like pork chops? Oh, bacon, that's it. Bring home the bacon. Do you remember me saying that in class ever? Yeah, so when we think pork barrel legislation, we want to think bringing home the bacon, okay? All right, so let's look. A senator from a coal-producing state voting against a job training program for coal miners. Doesn't make sense. Why would you do that to your coal mining people, right? Uh, a member of the House voting for urban renewal in exchange for increased funding for roads. Hmm. More money, okay? C, a senator from an agricultural state amending legislation to establish a potato research institute in his or her state. This is all interesting. And D, a member of the House Armed Services Committee marking up a bill that will increase funding for military bases. All right, so what do we think here? Pork barrel legislation. Did you already answer it? I forget what the answer was, if I'm being completely right. honest. Mm. I think that this is a tricky one because, uh, now I know what the answer is, I'm pretty sure. This is a tricky one because pork barrel regis legislation, what did I say to think of whenever you think of this? Bring home, the, bring home the bacon, right? So I need to bring it to my state. Does that make sense? Only one of these talks about them actually bringing money to their state. The other ones talk about increasing funding, but it doesn't say where that funding is going to go. Does that make sense? So this is the AP gods giving you a lot of possible right answers, but only one of them is most correct. I hate when they do this. No, I love it. It's great. <laughs> so for me, I think it's probably C. You guys agree? Was it C? I don't even remember what was there. It was C? Yeah. Because it says his or her state. And that B was, was the other one, right? That could have been possibly right. Could have been, yeah. Or increasing funding for military bases, you could technically say, but the base would have to be in your right. specific state, along with other things. But too, yeah. still, you wouldn't, that, you wouldn't consider the military bases a part Absolutely. of the state. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's federal government. Right. Yeah. So, so 
So this one, if we click B, I bet because it says it's not to your state. Remember the house? So Portal is just doing like of your state specifically, or your congressional district if you're a member of the House. Yeah. Because theoretically, if I bring that money back to my constituents, they're going to be very pleased with that. Does that make sense? And if my constituents are pleased with me, what are they going to do with me? They're going to keep me in office. I'll keep making my $173,000 a year. Uh, really? It's going to be more office. Oh, yeah. Base I. Bring it to the state specifically, yeah. For example, like when the president talks about their plan, it makes the person like, it makes the voters look like stupid. Yeah. Like, want to vote for him because he has a plan, not like just want to run for him. Sure enough, yeah. Alright, what other ones do we want to see? Is this jogging your guys' minds at all? Are you remembering some things or not really? Kind of. Presidents, signing statements. What are signing statements again? Oh, like the market takes a uh, on the bill. Yeah. And then objections to legislation within the signing statements. So Reagan had 250 signing statements, 35% of which objected to legislation within it, or had objections to legislation within the signing statements. George H.W. Bush, 228, 47%. W had the highest, right? So let's move w. down here and see what it says. W, yeah. George W. Bush. Which of the following statements most accurately supported by the data on the table? President Clinton greatly reduced the use of presidential signing statements compared to his predecessors. Uh, I guess you could say that. Uh, while President George W. Bush issued fewer signing statements than President Clinton, George W. Bush, fewer signing statements than President Clinton, yeah has included more objections than President Clinton's. That one looks pretty good. Uh, President Clinton's brief access to the power of the line item veto allowed him to use fewer signing statements that raised concerns about legislation. Does it say anything about line item vetoes in here? No, so that's AP guys trying to toy with your mind, okay? Don't pay attention to stuff like that. If it's not in the graph, it doesn't exist. Uh, D, President George W. Bush was forced to issue more signing statements as a direct result of the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. Are we allowed to assume that? No, we're not allowed to assume that. Uh, so I would say we're between A and B. The only reason that I would say it couldn't be A, and I might be wrong, is because it says greatly reduced. What does that mean? And compared with his predecessors. Yeah. Well. He has the most though. Oh, did it say signing statements or did it say objections? Signing statements. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah. Then obviously that's not true. He has 381 compared to those two other ones. Perfect. What? It's got to be B. Um, compared to the president, like he didn't reduce them compared to the president. Yeah. Got it. Six? Yeah. Same graph? Yeah. Uh, which of the following best explains the reason that a president might use a signing statement to express displeasure with a bill as opposed to issuing a veto? The president might have objections to provisions of a bill, but does not want to risk Congress overriding a veto. Uh, what do we remember about vetoes? What does it take for Congress to veto the or to override the president? Yeah, two thirds vote in both the House and the Senate. Is that something that's likely to happen? Probably not. So I don't know that the president would necessarily fear that. B, Congress has severely curtailed the power of the president to withhold funds for bills that have been adopted. I don't know. The, the Supreme Court is hesitant to acknowledge the president's power to veto legislation. Hmm. Uh, the president wants to ensure executive agencies do not spend the money appropriated by Congress. This is all odd. Hmm. 
What do you guys think here? The only one that makes sense is A. Yeah, I'm kind of going back to A, even though I didn't like that it said that they'd be concerned with the veto. These other ones are kind of like, they're far out there, right? Did you already click it? Is that what you said that? Oh. Did you already know the answer? That's what I was getting at. No. Uh, I agree with you. Yeah, it's a... Sometimes you're going to have questions like that. It's like, this is the only one that makes any possible sense at all. I try to weed those out when I give you guys tests, but... Can we look at 19? Sure. I'm sure. confused because it seems like A and D are like the same thing. Uh, that's what it does. Status of capital punishment in the United States by state in 2016. So states with capital punishment are the light gray. States oh. without are the dark. This is an easy one, sorry. That... It is an easy one? Yeah. What is it? A D. I was, I was, oh, yeah. I was thinking separation of powers was difference powers between state and federal government, but it's just oh, the no. branches. Yep, separation of powers and branches, that's good to know. Which judicial review? Um, the power of the Supreme Court to? Check on the president. Review laws? Yeah, to review laws for what? Ah, there it is, Miss Simon. Yeah, constitutionality, right? Is this law constitutional or is it not? The judicial branch reviewing laws, judicial review. Okay. Cool. Sixteen? Yeah. Keep in mind whatever you have. All right, which of the following is generally the most important? This was a question that we had on an exam. All right. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> All right, which of the following is generally the most important agent of political socialization? Who do you have? Who are you going to follow usually? Your family. It's just laws. You remember that one. What do you mean? Oh, how does that, you make it sound like it's surprising? <laughs> not dense. I never funny. said you were dense. Maybe it's funny. What's Maybe up? Maybe it's funny. Oh, implied powers. 20? Yeah. Okay. All right, an important Senate race takes place in the state of Georgia. Rather than focus on the issue positions taken by the candidates, a 24-hour cable news station instead focuses on, on primarily on poll results and campaign strategies using a big board to show the counties where each candidate has the most support. Which of the following is an effect of this type of news coverage? Uh, a, the, so let's think about this first, right? 24-hour cable news station. They're focusing on pri or on primarily on poll results. Okay, so we'll say like we have Savalos. Uh, um, who else is here? Simon. Luzma. I'll just leave it right here for now. So we're focused on poll results. Okay. All right. So we've got the Luzma going up. Right? We've got Simon going up a little bit. We've got Savalos going up here, okay? All right, so this is where we're at at the 12 o'clock hour. Now it's a 1 o'clock hour. Uh, the Luzman has dropped a little bit, all right? Simon's gone up even further. Savalos has stayed the same, all right? Now I'll get back with you at the 2 o'clock hour. We'll check back in on our polls. So this is kind of what it's describing here, right? Looking at the poll results and campaign strategies using a big board to show the counties where each candidate has the most support. So if I'm doing this, right, showing that everybody's going up and down, what kind of effect is saying might that have on the counties themselves or the state? So would it be the electorate will be increasingly divided along partisan lines or party lines? Probably not. They're already divided how they're going to be divided, right? That's just the way it goes. All right, B, the electorate will be more likely to turn out to vote on election day. Are you more or less likely based on this? See, the electorate will be more likely to have expanded knowledge of the electoral process. No, you're not going to have any knowledge of the electoral process based on something like this. Okay? The electorate will be less able to accurately compare the policy platforms of candidates running in the election. Probably that, right? Do you remember what this was called and what type of uh, journalism or reporting? Uh, horse. Yeah, horse race, right? Yeah, yeah there it is. 
scenario is an example of the trustee model of representation. So first of all, we have to ask ourselves, what is the trustee model of representation? If you've elected me as your candidate and I'm your trustee candidate or representative, what does that mean? Yeah, their best interest. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All right, let's look. Uh, the NAACP leadership sends representatives to Washington to lobby for changes to the Voting Rights Act. It's not really trustee representation. Uh, it's more lobbying, right? Uh, so B, Congress passed a bill allocating money to clean up nuclear waste sites after a wave of large-scale peaceful protests. No. A member of Congress votes to close a popular tax loophole based on the belief that the money would be better spent paying down the national debt. Or a presidential candidate advocates using an executive order to increase the minimum wage for federal contractors. So is the candidate a representative? If you're a candidate, what does that mean? The definition of candidate, you know? Yeah, it means you're running to be a representative essentially. So you're not a representative, yeah. Uh, trustee model. We said somebody's making a decision on the best interest of the people, right? So which one do we think it could be? I agree with you, yeah. Member of Congress, definitely a representative, votes to close a popular tax loophole. It's popular, right? The people like it. And even though the people like it, they have to trust that their representative is doing what's in their best interest, right? Which in this case is paying down the national debt. Does that make sense? Yes, kind of? Yeah, I think it's C. Yeah. But it has to be with one person doing it? Not necessarily one person doing it. Um, but this is passing, uh, yeah, so I, are you saying why is it not B? Congress as a whole, right? Yeah, so it's not, that's, so they're both kind of right. One is more right, because we're talking about the trustee model of representation. That's me trusting my candidate is going to do the right thing for me. I, I don't trust all of Congress, right? But I do trust my candidate, possibly. Yeah, yeah, so let's look at why it says not be. Passage of legislation to risk cause brought to the attention of Congress by way of popular protest more closely reflects the delegate model of representation as well. Okay, because they did what the peaceful protesters were asking for, is why. Yeah, delegate model means that I've asked the person or they know the constituency wants it. Here, right, with this trustee one, it doesn't have to be that they're doing the opposite of what the constituency wants, but they're acting in the best interest of the constituency, right? Here, they're acting in the best interest, essentially, of themselves, because it says after a wave of peaceful protests. They didn't do it before the peaceful protests. It was reactionary to the people. I, okay, I read it like the, the, the peaceful protests don't. They, they, they the no, I don't think so. No, they passed a bill to clean up nuclear waste sites after there was a large scale peaceful protest. Uh, what other ones? 23? 23? Yeah. Uh, cool. Shows the makeup of the House of Representatives and the makeup of the Senate. All right. Based on your knowledge of the diagram, which of the following is true regarding the leadership structure of Congress? The role of the minority leader 
and both the House of Representatives and the Senate is to coordinate a strategy for the minority party, the minority leader. So House Minority Leader, Senate Minority Leader. Okay. I like that one so far. Because they're both the top, right, for the minority. Uh, B, the Vice President is responsible for creating and setting the legislative agenda for the Senate. If you remember, when we say the Vice President's only real job is in the Senate, No, so the pro tempore is the temporary president of the Senate, so they're the backup for the vice president. So how many members are in the Senate, do you recall? 100, right? So if we have a vote in the Senate, theoretically what could happen? Yeah, right, there could be a tie. All, really, all, vice president's only job, tiebreaker, okay? And obviously they're gonna vote whichever way the uh, majority Sorry, not the majority, the executive branch is, right? Tiebreaker. <laughs> Essentially, so I don't know of any special name for it. Uh, all right, so it's not that. C, the Speaker of the House has very little power to control members of the majority party in the House of Representatives. That's not true. In fact, they are the strongest person in the House of Representatives. They set the agenda for uh, the House. They uh, set the rules for debate. Uh, they do all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, uh, the majority leaders in both chambers work to ensure that a bipartisan agenda is passed in the Congress. What does bipartisan mean? Both. both parties. Would the majority leaders want to work on bipartisan things all the time? No, I'm gonna push through what my party wants, right? So for me, that leaves one answer. I think so. Does that make sense? The role of minority leader in both the House and the Senate is coordinated strategy for the minority party. Because if you look here, right, the Speaker of the House belongs to the majority. The Vice President has no true power. The President pro tempore sits in for the Vice President. So really, it's going to be the Senate Majority Leader and Senate Minority Leaders that are the quasi leaders of the Senate. So yeah, I think Ed. So far, we've only got one wrong. The delay in action taken by the President of the United States with regard to the legislation. The Commerce Clause is the federal government's ability to determine whether or not an action is impacting uh, federal money or allocations or revenue in some form or fashion. And if it does, it allows them to trump state laws, which is really the Supremacy Clause as well. returned by the president within 10 days Sunday is accepted after it shall have been presented to him the same shall be a law in like manner as if he signed it unless the Congress by their adjournment prevent its return in which case it shall not be a law so that's the if it's Congress in session 10 days afterwards it becomes law if they're out of session after that 10 days it's pocket vetoed. So it's 
So the term pocket veto is something that we have made up at some point after the Constitution. It's stated there. It's stated there. It's in Article One. Yeah. Twenty nine. Twenty nine. Yeah. I'm not too familiar with all the definitions of which polls are which. Oh, that's fine. Oh no 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 no! Ah. Did you see it? No, I looked away. Did you? Okay. All right. Uh, so let's talk about these polls real quick, I guess. <clears throat> So an exit poll, that's pretty much like in the in the word, right? What is an exit poll? As soon as you get out of voting, you That's what? As soon as you vote you Yeah, when you're leaving, you're exiting, they ask you, hey, who'd you vote for? Right? So then they'll take that number and this is what they call an exit poll. Alright, a benchmark poll is kind of like it sounds, right? There's different benchmarks that they're expecting to hit essentially. Uh, different benchmarks, and that is the benchmark poll. The opinion poll, people's opinions on things, uh, how do you think the vote will go, who do you think you'll vote for, and then the tracking poll tracks the way the poll goes over the course of time. Right? So a media organization is interested in reporting election results in a congressional election prior to the final tally of votes, which will not occur until later in the evening. The organization randomly selects several polling places across the district asking voters whom they voted for. Okay. The type poll being used in this scenario is known as. So they're asking voters who they voted for. Maybe. I would say it either has to be a tracking one or an exit one based on this description. So the exit poll, Mr. Rosano and I were just saying, they ask you as you're leaving the polling place who you voted for. The tracking poll is going to follow votes over the course of like a day or two days or a week, something like this. I personally think it's, egg, it's exit poll here, yeah. And the whole reason I think that is the organization randomly selects several polling places across the district asking voters who they voted, right? Past times for. Who did you vote for? Does that make sense? If it had said that this organization was like, they started on Monday, right? And then they tallied votes Monday through Friday, that would be a tracking poll. If I went up to Mr. Rosano and I said, hey, who do you think is going to win the election? That would be an opinion poll, right? Let's click it so it tells us the AP guys definition. Benchmark polls are generally taken at the beginning of a campaign to find out how much support a candidate has in an election. Exit polls are frequently used to predict winners of elections. So the benchmark poll, they didn't explain it very well. The benchmark poll, like it says here, right? They're taken at the beginning of a campaign to determine whether or not, like, let's say we were taking a benchmark bark poll on you, Mr. Savalas, to find out if you have enough traction to even have you run as a candidate for the political party. Does that make sense? Do you hit the benchmark, the standards to carry you forward? You could say that, yeah, yeah. I wanna be sure there's enough traction for you. Otherwise, I'm sinking money into you senselessly. Uh, 34. Yeah. I mean, it seems really easy, but it's not, so, maybe could be wrong. Yeah. All right, number of residents per electoral vote. Interesting. So, what do we know the electoral votes are tied to, first of all? Based on population. Mm, kind of. So the House of Representatives, right, the number of members of the House you have is tied to population, but the electoral vote is a merger of two numbers, if you remember. Look back at the Electoral College map. What could that possibly mean, these numbers? What are we adding together to get those numbers? 
Uh, the, yeah, Senate and House of there it is, yeah. So Northern South Dakota, for example, they get the minimum number of representation for the House of Representatives, which is one, okay? They have two senators because that's what the Constitution says. Every state will have two senators. So their electoral college vote is three. Does that make sense? All right, so that's what we know about the electoral college then. Roughly, each member of the House represents somewhere around 700,000 people, give or take. <coughs> All right, given the information in the graph, in which of the following states would an individual's vote likely have more influence? So it shows us residents per vote in thousands. You guys are doing a lot of work with graphs right now, so these graphs should be easy for you to read, right? I don't know, I just heard you were doing a lot of stuff with graphs. It sounds terrible. All right, down here is the states, okay? So, just looking at this, right, in which state is your voice going to be loudest? In which state are you going to have the most influence? Wyoming. I think Wyoming. Is that what you're looking at, Mr. Rosano, Wyoming? Why? Because you need less people to vote for every single vote, like per vote. You only need 150 people to vote the same way instead of 650. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So I think of it like almost like water or something like that, right? So, so it's like over 600 drops of water and 150 drops of water. Or the bottle. I don't know, how can I explain this? Your vote's not as diluted, I guess is what I'm looking to say. Does that make sense? In the state of Wyoming. If there's only 100... 50,000 people voting, my personal vote means more than it does in a, a group of 650,000. Does that make sense? No. It'd be like in here, for example, like there's four of you right now, and if I took a vote among you, and there's one to three, I'd be more liable to ask the one person, like, why do you feel like you do, right? But if we were in the gym and there's 1,000 people and 700 people raise their hand for yes and 300 for no, I don't care about 300 as much as I do the one individual inside of the room. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, any other numbers? Yeah. Uh, so the data in the graph best illustrates which of the following common criticisms of the Electoral College. Small states have fewer electoral votes than large states and therefore have no impact on presidential elections. Uh, the OLA is true. This doesn't necessarily show us the electoral votes, right? So the AP gods don't assume stuff on the graphs, um, although sometimes I guess you might have to. But for now, I'd say A is not correct. Individuals in small population states have greater impact on the electoral college than individuals in large population states. We kind of just said that in 34, uh, and that was the right answer. So I'm going to keep B in my back pocket for now. Candidates from states with large numbers of electoral college votes have a major advantage in the electoral college. That doesn't really make sense to me. Uh, D, smaller states have more electoral votes than larger states. We know that's simply not true, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily matter how big or small your state is. Oh, well, it does, sorry. Population-wise, right? But size-wise, it doesn't necessarily matter, uh, which just sorts of popular vote. Yeah, I was talking to you in D.C. That's B, right? I think it has to be B. So C, candidates from states with a large number of electoral votes have a major advantage. Is it it's candidates, though? Like, not, not, not like yeah. Candidates, like those, but, like, so if... They're saying like presidential candidates. I don't even know what kind of candidates we're talking about here. It has to be presidential. Uh, they're isn't like the like as in representatives. Oh, no? Yeah. Oh, like state it's state. not representatives. It's candidates. People that are looking to be representatives. It's the electoral college, so it has way not candidates. Yeah, it's but not. You don't have candidates for the. It has to be presidential, obviously, yeah, because the electoral college yeah. is right. Unless you're talking about the representatives, and that makes your electoral vote number. I don't know what they're talking about there, so. I don't I'm going to stay away from T. Yeah. Yeah, it's B. I want to see what the explanation for this is. Here's the 
explanation is usually really bad. Yeah, it's not a cool explanation. <laughs> like they're actually really bad most of them. Yeah. Just repeat the answer. Twenty-seven. Yeah. Do we need twenty-six to answer twenty-seven? Not really. Okay. Uh, number of African American Southern state legislators. Oh my God. And then we can see that from the time of the Civil Rights Movement to 1992, that number has gone up uh, quite significantly. Right. Which of the following statements pres or presents, presents the most important limitation of the data and the graph? Which of the following statements presents the most important limitation of the data? The time frame for the data is misleading. I don't think it's misleading. I don't find it misleading. Do you guys? There's no information about the total number of state legislators. I mean, that's true. It just says the number of African American and Southern state legislators. I don't know if it limits it or not. There are insufficient data points to detect a trend. Oh, I can see a pretty clear trend here, right? Uh, the trend over time is potentially misleading. It would be easier to read in a pie chart. <laughs> I don't think so. I prefer it this way myself. But yeah, none of it makes sense. I, it, B is the only one that really makes sense because it doesn't show the total number of state legislators. It shows what the. What impact would that have? What's that? What impact would that have? The imp, I guess the only impact it would truly have is that you could see the number of non African American Southern state legislators and then see how like that number has dwindled over the course of time. I don't know. That's the only one that makes sense though, right? We can look at what their explanation is for it. It's gotta be B, do we agree? Yeah. Yeah. One important limitation of the graph says it's not given the total number of all state legislators, it only gives information of the African American state legislators in the South. We know the total number, we can better visualize the magnitude of progress on the issue. See, I don't necessarily agree with that. You can still see the magnitude of the progress without that, but there's, there's the AP gods for you, right? You might see a question like that at the end of the day. I wish that I could be like AP board and be like, that is a ridiculous question, but no, that's not the way it works. Yeah. All right, which of the following best explains how partisan differences, so remember partisan just means party. Party differences between the president and Congress affect policy making in the federal government. So if we have a difference between the president and Congress in either of the houses, we have a dividing government, okay? And it's divided because where the law making happens is different than where the law signing happens and the execution of the laws. Does that make sense? All right, so it would weaken the power of congressional party leadership in the House of Representatives. Uh, because the rules require a majority of members to approve bills. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, it reduces the chances of bills becoming law because the president and the majority party in Congress are from different parties. That one feels like it so far. Uh, it leads to fewer bills <coughs> being introduced into Congress because it's less likely that these bills will make it through politically divided committees. Uh, no, because the majority party is the one that creates the committees, so they're not really all that politically divided. Does that make sense? All this is done in caucuses, if you remember that word, private meetings. Uh, D, it reduces the incentive to work across party lines because legislation that is vetoed can be overridden with two-thirds majority vote in both chambers. That doesn't make sense either. It's got to be B, yeah, because we're talking about a divided government, and this is like the definition of divided government, basically. Let's go. Is this helping at all? Is it? Okay. If it's not, be honest with me, I'll try to come up with like another way to do this. Would you prefer like a lecture session? I feel like this is better. I, I study best this way, but it doesn't mean you do. What? Like a Okay. Yeah, we'll do a final review. Maybe on like the last session. April 9th.
what the House of Representatives does, whereas what the Senate does, and like the differences between those and then also like executive and like judicial, like I'll find that later. Okay, so we'll look at so for the branches, right, the executive, the easiest way that I can describe this to you, and it's going to seem trivial, but here we go, executive, executes the laws. Does that make sense? They enforce them, execute. Legislative starts with the L, they're making the laws. That's how I always remembered it simply. That's a terrible explanation, isn't it, Ms. Rizzano? Um, that's how I remember things too. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, legislative lawmaking, right? Executive, it's right here in the word, right? Execute the laws. Ms. Rizzano, why'd you make that face when I read it? Let's we'll see, I have a good one. Sometimes a simple explanation is the best explanation. Fun time. Somebody told me if you can't explain something to a five-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. What's the difference between block grant and categorical grant? So block grants, remember, is just a big. Here, I'm gonna explain it very like in a weird way. Block grants. I'm taking a block of money. I give it to you. Zzz, right. Go and do the money stuff. Categorical grants is I'm categorizing how you can use it. Okay. Yeah, the government's going to have all kinds of hooks and categorical grants to be sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, or what they want you to do, I should say. What was it called again? Like when the government oversees like Congressional oversight. Okay. Yeah. What was the other type of. Oh, we talked. Oh, it was block grants, categorical grants? That was it. That was it. And man, did mandates go with that whenever we were doing the notes? Must have been. It was in that, yeah. Mandates, okay. But it was like, but states prefer. Yeah. Yeah, they prefer the block grants. <laughs> State has an oversimplified explanation, but it works. So Marbury versus Madison established a really important concept. Judicial yeah, judicial review. Really, you don't have to know the ins and outs of it, I wouldn't say, because they're going to always ask you, if, if, it's like a, if it shows up in a SCOTUS comparison question, it's going to ask you to compare the two main like clauses or the two main thing, components right, of the two cases. So if you know Marbury versus Madison established judicial review and you know what judicial review is, you'll be able to explain yourself through this ghost comparison. Now, if you want like a breakdown kind of of what happened, yeah. Uh, I always mix the names on this when I'm telling the story. So essentially Marbury was supposed to get a position in the federal government, okay? And I can't remember who was the president. Was it Adams? So John Adams, he came into the presidency, right? He had just entered the presidency, and he had told James Madison to not issue the, I can't think of the word right now, 
to not issue the whatever document said that Matt, or, uh, Marbury was going to get his position. Okay, he said, no, we're not going to present him with that job. I don't want him there. I'm the president of the United States. Do not, as commission, do not deliver him his commission. Okay? Madison was the Secretary of State, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So the Secretary of State would be, well, number one, the person to deliver these commissions to the different people for the different positions in the federal government. Okay. They meet with foreign leaders. They do like all kinds of different things. Yeah. One of the cabinet. They're one of the cabinet members. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so he tells Madison, don't deliver the commission to Marbury. I don't want him. Okay, so Madison says, sure, I won't do it. Marbury sues Madison for not delivering the commission. Okay? It wasn't his fault. Wasn't his fault. And not only that, okay, when the Supreme Court looks at it, because this is an issue with the federal government, they decide that not only is it not Madison's fault, but it's not the executive branch's job, right? Or sorry, it's not the judicial branch's job to tell the executive branch that they have to deliver the commission to somebody to give them a federal job. Does that make sense to you guys? They say this is a kind of like an overlapping of powers. There's these checks and balances that exist for a reason. So the judicial branch in this case refuses to rule in the favor of Marbury, although they might have, right? They refuse to rule on that because they say it would give them a precedent to meddle in what the executive branch does. And that's not what they're supposed to do, right? Their only job is to, the judicial branch? Uh, interpret. Interpret, right? We're interpreting laws, determining whether or not things are constitutional. And they say it would be unconstitutional <laughs> of us because of the separation of powers that exists in the Constitution to force the executive branch to deliver the commission. So we're not going to do that. And in doing so, they create judicial review. Does that make sense? Judicial review doesn't really exist up until this exact point, which is still at the beginning. It was 1804 or something like that. Is that right? Do you have the year there? No. No, it's 18 something, very early on. So they established judicial review in this case where they are going to actually look at laws and they can strike out certain things from federal law that they deem unconstitutional. So really what they end up doing is kind of brilliant, right? They, instead of saying, we're gonna have the power to meddle in what the executive branch does, no, we don't care what the executive branch necessarily does as long as it's constitutional. We are going to give ourselves the power to review every single federal law if we need to and we want to to determine constitutionality. Okay. Can you go forty-four? Yeah. It's kind of weird. When I first started teaching, I was doing a lesson on Marbury versus Madison, and it was the principal who was in the room for it, and like I was still kind of learning the case myself, to be completely honest with you guys. So I like started going and Marbury and Madison and Marbury like it's the, all of them. So I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? The principal didn't know what judicial review was. Uh, what was the question? What number? Forty-four. Forty-four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Which of the following is correct? Is the correct pairing of powers found in the Articles of Confederation? and powers found in the Constitution. So if you remember, the Articles of Confederation uh, gave more power to, <coughs> to a government entity. Where'd most of the power fall <coughs> in order the Articles? Military. What's that? Oh, but they didn't have the military. Yeah, there was a military in the Articles. Oh, state. The states, yeah, the state governments. Okay, uh, there are lots of other uh, weaknesses that we looked at. Did we talk about Shays Rebellion? I can't remember. We did, right? What were some of the weaknesses that led to Shays Rebellion? Um, the government could have protected. Yeah, so no military, obviously, right? But why didn't they have a military more specifically? Why couldn't they incentivize it? No, yeah, they could not enforce taxes, right? They could borrow money. I think it couldn't enforce taxes. <clears throat> All right, so let's see. Uh, Articles of Confederation, protection of individual liberties. Does the United States Constitution have no protection? Interesting. This is an interesting one. I like A, the question of A. 
Uh, the Articles protected individual liberties. Uh, there was not like a Bill of Rights in the Articles of Confederation. Uh, powerful executive branch in the Articles of Confederation. There was only one branch of government under the Articles of Confederation. Do you remember what it was? Yeah, they only had a legislative branch. No president. Why didn't they want an executive? Exactly, they were afraid, okay? They had just ended the Revolutionary War. They thought it was too much to give one person that amount of power, okay? They even talked about like a six-person executive branch at one point in time, like a panel. Uh, so Articles of Confederation, unicameral legislature. Yeah, that means one legislature. Uh, in the Constitution, what does bicameral legislature mean? Two parties. Two parties. Two parts, yeah, I think it's a party, sorry. Two parts, okay? So two-part legislature. Is there a two-part legislature? Yeah. There is. So let's look at the amendment requires you unanimity of all states. Uh, that is true for the articles. If you want to change it, you needed all 13 states to vote that way. Uh, amendment requires the president's approval. That's not true. An amendment does not require the president's approval. Uh, so I would say C in this case. There's only the legislative branch, so UNA, one, bicameral legislature, set up in the Constitution. So really, you had to know, yeah, you just have to know the articles, right? Every time I do one, I choose another wrong answer. Really? I started with B, and then I chose D, and then C. Yeah, so, yeah, like I said, B was wrong, there was no executive branch. Uh, in the Constitution, the federal government is supreme over the states, only in the cases of conflict and laws, though, essentially. Uh. For this one? No. This was at the transition, right? So what happened? You said I thought you had said John Adams was the new president, but I think that he was the president on his way out, and Jefferson was coming in. Yeah. So it was Jefferson who told Madison, "Don't deliver the commission to Marbury," right? Adams had commissioned Marbury, yeah. right? And the commission never made it to him before Adams was leaving office. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then who chooses the secretary of state? The president of the United States does. And then so why did Jefferson just like kick him out and like choose a different person? Kick Marbury out? Yeah. Marbury uh, wasn't no, being commissioned yeah. as Secretary of State. Madison was his Secretary of State, right? Oh, 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 right. He was commissioned as Justice of Peace? Was it? So Justice of Peace means like a judge. Marbury was being commissioned as a judge. Remember, it's the president who appoints judges. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the Senate that confirmed them. So apparently the Senate had confirmed Marbury, right? And that commission, the affirmation, never made it to Marbury before Adams left office. Then when Jefferson took office, Jefferson said, nah, I don't want him as one of my judges. He never got his commission. I'm not going to give it to him. That way he doesn't have his job. Does that make sense? But it wasn't Jefferson's job to give it to him. It was Madison's job to give it to him, according to how the law was written at that time. And then the judicial branch struck out that portion of the law. They said that's unconstitutional. We shouldn't have all this, this meddling going on. And we're not going to rule on whether or not Madison's going to have to go and do that because it's unconstitutional of us for, to, to have to decide on that. It gives the judicial branch too much power over the executive branch. Does that make sense? So they reviewed that law that said that and said it's unconstitutional, done. Does that make sense? Kind of. Justice of Peace is a judge and appointed by Senate, you said? 
Confirmed. Appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. So you basically vote in order to like approve it. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, the president could just go around hiring all of his friends <coughs> to be judge, federal judges. You're like a 47. Yeah. Uh, which of the following pair of Supreme Court cases best illustrates how views of federalism have shifted in the United States? Well, it's between B and C, uh, but I think C is both examples of the states uh, having an upper hand in the decision because Citizens United is like the uh, the news one, right? Yeah. And uh, not the news one. Citizens United is the one where the corporation uh, used business money to make the Hillary Clinton video uh, kind of like bashing her and her campaign, and they did it within 60 days of the election. Um, and that was not allowed through the, I can't think of it, the BCRA, Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. Um, so that section of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act ended up getting slashed out, and they determined that corporate money was just as good as free speech. So Citizens United won? Citizens United won, yeah, they're a corporation that used their money. In favor of the video? Correct. Yeah. Okay, now, so it wasn't decided on until after the election, so all they did was set precedent moving forward. So then it has to be beat because McCollum was there and that was the bank one, right? Yeah. And the bank one was a pair with the, the, uh, the federal. Good. And United States for the Bill passed with the gun one, right? Yeah. Wait, no, Chicago's the gun one. No, you're, Lopez, you're right. Lopez, oh, the kid bringing the gun to school. Yeah. And that was in favor of the state. Wow. Correct. So yeah. it's gotta be beat, right? Yeah, and that would show that shift, right? Because the other one, this wouldn't really show a shift because they ruled in favor of McDonald here, right? So they ruled in favor of the quote unquote people, like the corporation, right? They're they viewed as a person, and McDonald one here, so that's person to person. So yeah, I agree with you. I think it's probably B. This is um, the news one. Prior restraint, yeah. And this is the pamphlet. Yeah, I think it's gotta be B. These are fun questions. Wait, I don't, D, wait, now that I look at it, look at it. So the a, federal a, a doesn't have anything really to do with it because Brown versus Board of Education, that was a whole that was even considered federalism, right? Brown versus Board, was yeah it reversed Plessy versus Ferguson right? It was it didn't even have to do with use of federalism. Mm, no, no. <coughs> but D was um was in favor of the the government having control over that. This was in favor of the United States, yeah. And then the other one was in favor of independent corporations. That's what you're talking about. D. This was in favor of New York Times, what you're saying. Wait, did they have prior restraint in that? Wait, they stopped United States won in that? Yeah, let's click it find out. Mm -hmm. uh, fair enough. So it wasn't a, that, that makes sense. It wasn't a question of state powers, it was a question of the First Amendment rights. This was a this was a complete question of state powers, right? Did Maryland have the ability to tax federal government? Did Lopez have to face Texas legislation or federal legislation? Does that make sense? I see what they're doing now. Finally, I didn't see it before. I think that they would say the same thing if we clicked on C, for example. This wasn't necessarily state stuff. Yeah, so McDonald Chicago was related to federalism because of the Second Amendment being applied to the states, um, but Citizens United was not. Yeah, 
Like we said, and talk about free speech. Does that make sense? 